I'm honored that you're here and sharing with us. Please tell everybody um, that, you know, that you're here in the center of this picture. And this was a sit-in. Where was this? Right. This was 1963. I'm the one staring vacantly into space with the uh, clipboard. And uh, it's uh, 1963. It's a Toddle House, House restaurant, which is like, you know, the Wendy's or something. It was a, a major chain throughout the uh, the South. And uh, right after this, you would see other people. The the um, head behind me um, is John Lewis's head. He was down the, then the chair of SNCC. Um, to my looking at it to the left, is mm -hmm. Joyce Ladner, who uh, became a prominent sociologist, um, acting president of Howard University, um, and is now on our SNCC legacy board. And you would see a number of folks. You would also see um, Ivanhoe Donaldson, who was looking out the window in the back because he's looking to see if the police are coming. Um, he becomes a major strategist for Black politicians' campaigns, including Julian Bond in Atlanta. I ran the SNCC off the uh, office. He ran the campaign. Um, and then for Marion Barry, um, and was deputy mayor for Marion's first um, first stint as mayor of Washington, D.C. But right after this, we all got arrested and spent time in jail. Oh, wow. OK. And what's this picture here? Yeah, this is uh, in the, what we call the workroom in the Atlanta National Office. You know, we had projects all over the Deep South, but we had a main office where we had a photo department. We sent out photographers. We had a research department. Uh, we had an amazing research department. Um, it it was the hub. It was the major hub uh, for the organization. Julian Bond worked out of that for the communications department. We had a printing press. We had all this stuff. So that's the Atlanta National Office. And we're all in there. Evidently, there was a staff meeting because you see John in there kind of mm -hmm. to my, uh, over my head, you would see Julian way far right with a, his cigarette hanging out his mouth. You would see Marion Barry, you would see Jim Foreman uh, with the button on and his head kind of down. Um, all of these folks, oh, Gene, Gene Smith, who was to to my camera right, uh, to the right of looking at me on the photo, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is is uh, Gene Smith, who was one of the editors of Hands on the Freedom Plow and whom, I speak with every two weeks along with two other SNCC women who are our, our editors. And we do what we do, what we call the Fab Four Girlfriends Call to talk about politics and um, our lives generally. So, <laughs> so it's wonderful. So we have an amazing call to be on. <laughs> yes, it was. It actually is. It's great. <laughs> but we have our coats on because I think we just didn't have any heat. One of the many times we didn't have any heat. Mm. So, but it was, but we're, and we're singing a freedom song, which is why my mouth is open and I'm about to clap. <laughs> well, I'll I'll dive into uh, some of the questions, but I this these two pictures kind of prompted another one in me. But we'll 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 go with some of the stuff that we wanted to get to first. Okay. So you know we do a lot of work fighting extremism, and today's extremists want to change history and tell made up stories. But you know this isn't new. I know that you you heard these kinds of things too. So tell us how you learned about Reconstruction when you were in school, and how did it feel to listen to the distortions and outright fairy tales that were told? <laughs> Absolutely. And by the way, I'm going to read from my notes because at this point in my life, if I don't read from notes, we would be here all night long because I would be going <laughs> off into tributaries. I'd never come back. So. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I first learned um, about Reconstruction when I was the only Black student in my 10th grade um, AP history class. And this was at Sleepy Hollow High School in Tarrytown, New York, just 45 miles north of New York City. So this was the North, right? And in this piece on Reconstruction, there were only three paragraphs, three, count them three. And that section used illustrations that were taken directly from the Klansmen which was that pro clan book on which that horrible white supremacist film, Birth of a Nation was based, right? Yeah. So I and my white classmates did not learn about all the incredible reforms mandated by those reconstruction state legislatures, including by the way, free public education, right? That was made available, not just to black people, but mm -hmm. to poor white children who had previously deliberately been denied that education. They did, we didn't learn about the 14th and 15th Amendments, sometimes called the the, the uh, uh, Reconstruction Amendments, um, which safeguard the freedom of all Americans. And they were passed at that time. But I didn't learn about them. My white classmates didn't learn about them. All we were taught was that Reconstruction was corrupt and dysfunctional. And the message from that was really clear. It's that this is what happens 
when Black folks are allowed to get into any positions of power. So my white classmates, as we're going through this, right, they're kind of looking over their shoulders at me and, you know, kind of surreptitiously. Um, and I was so embarrassed. I could not look up from my desk. I was just so embarrassed. So when white supremacists, you know, they, they talk about they want to pr protect their people, their children from feeling bad. But I still remember the pain that I felt when I and my classmates were consistently fed these lies and these distortions about this country's history. Wow. And, and what I'm talking about happened over 60 years ago, and I still remember it. Right. Right. And, and I mean, it, they say history repeats itself, and and I, but I'm not even 100% sure it even went away because, you know, I don't think that I got, well, we were taught very little Black history when I was in school. And that would have been in the seventies and, you know, it didn't get any better. Um, and so, you know, I can just say that this has been a continual problem, I think, um, all along unless, you know, and we'll get into what can make that better in a, in a bit. So, you know, we've talked about SNCC and we've shown a couple of pictures here, which is a student nonviolent coordinating committee in case anyone didn't know. Um, so what did organizing look like then? Because we know what organizing looks like now. We have social media. We have, you know, all of these ways to be able to connect with people. And you guys accomplished so much. How did you find participants? How did you get people involved? Because you didn't have cell phones. You know, how did this work? <laughs> And I'll tell you, um, I'll do it if, if um if in this question you want to talk about the communications part, I'll do that too. But I I'm very conscious of not talking too much. So um I'm gonna let let me just say I, I wanted I thought about this question a lot because I wanted to figure out, I wanted to make sure that I was giving you sharing information that would be helpful to the group that's on this call. So Obviously, we're, we were in SNCC. We were dealing with a different environment, right? Because SNCC primarily organized in the rural South among poorer Black folks. Sharecroppers like Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, and we discovered her, right? Um, uh, so she she came on SNCC staff, as a matter of fact. She was amazing, an amazing organizer. Um, and also, we were organizing a, a, um, among the rural Black landowners and business people, but always in the rural South. And our main concern really was, how do you get black people registered to vote without getting them killed, right? How do you get them registered without getting them killed? Mm -hmm. But we did have in SNCC something very common to what you're you in, in red, wine and blue, what you're dealing with. And that's that SNCC did really deep grassroots organizing work mm -hmm. and based on exactly what your organizing is based on, relationships and networking, right? And I think that's what all good organizing is based on. So initially we and SNCC were grounded in the activism coming out of the, the HBCUs, the black colleges um, in, the, in the South, um, starting with those first sit-ins in 1960. So students initially, you know, they're talking to their roommates and to their classmates, but then SNCC ex became an organization through the amazing, um, fortitude and organizing skills of our mentor, Miss Ella Baker. And you can't talk about Snicker without talking about Miss Ella Baker, but she brings all those students together to her alma mater, Shaw University um, in 1961. And um, uh, we become an organization of small, it's small initially, um, but we change from doing sit-ins really to doing voter registration. So sometimes we went into a community already having a contact. Sometimes we didn't, and we had to start by going to Black high schools or going house to house, visiting the Black churches, going to barber shops, hair parlors, sitting with local residents while they took the measure of us. And that's important because if you're going to put your lives and the livelihoods of your family and your whole community, right, in the hands of this organizer, who, by the way, is 19, 20 years old, and you're probably in your 40s and 50s then you have to take the measure of this organizer, this young organizer sitting in front of you talking about, you know, have you thought about registering your vote? Even though you, the person we're talking to, knows that other people in your community, when they tried to register, had been lynched, had been killed, 
had you had had to send them up to Chicago to get them out of harm's way. So they are dealing with very real, understandable um, threats if they go to vote. So they have to know that you are there, that you are somebody they can believe in, right? They have to be able to trust you. And we always lived right in the community where we organized. That's also where we would have an office. Sometimes we lived with a local community member. Sometimes we had an office um, that was rented to us by a, a, a black businessman. But I'll give you an example. Okay. When SNCC's legendary Bob Moses first goes into Mississippi, right? It's 1961. He's told to contact a local NAACP leader, Amzie Moore. And it's Ms. Baker, this incredible mentor, political strategist who brings these SNCC folks together for that first meeting. She's the one who gives him the contact of Amzie Moore. And Amzie is part of her extensive network of local grassroots organizers that she developed while she was traveling, developing all of these local movements from um, from really from DC all the way through to, to uh, MIMS, Florida, um, when she was director of branches for the NAACP. But they're all grassroots. They're not up here, Black people. They're here, Black people. So when Bob appears at Mr. Moore's house, and Mr. Moore, by the way, owned a gas station in Cleveland, Mississippi, but he was also a postal worker. So he had some independence, right? So Bob goes in, Mr. Moore's house is in Cleveland, Mississippi, right in the Delta of Mississippi. It's 1961. He tells Ms. Mr. Moore that Ms. Baker has sent him and is immediately taken in because Amzie knows Ms. Baker, has the utmost respect for Ms. Baker. He is part of Ms. Baker's network that she has now handed over to us SNCC folks who are 19 and 20 years old. Okay. Bob stays with Amzie and his family for six weeks and Amzie schools him about, schools Bob Moses about organizing in Mississippi. And Amzie says to Bob, look, you young people, you can talk about sitting in if you want to, but I'm not interested in that. He says, I'm interested in real power and getting the vote for black folks here in Mississippi. And then according to Bob, and by the way, I had heard about this story, but Bob Moses actually told me the story standing outside of Bob and, and his wife Janet's house when we were in the middle of production on this 14 hour Eyes on the Prize series. So Bob says to me, Amzie then takes out a precinct map, folds it out on his kitchen table, again, 1961. And Amzie says to Bob, look, I'm not, he said, these are where black folks are concentrated. And he shows it on this precinct map, 1961, Amzie Moore, Mississippi. Amzi says, I'm not ready for you here in, in, in Cleveland, Mississippi. But he says, C.C. Bryant is ready for you down in Amon County. And that was in the dangerous Southwest part of Mississippi. Now, Amzi knew about C.C. Bryant, who was a, a black businessman, because both of them had been returning black veterans from World War II. He, Amzi, C.C. Bryant, Medgar Evers, the NAACP Mississippi head who is later assassinated, and a bunch of other folks had started something called the Regional Council of Negro Leadership Network, right? And they'd been working on voting rights, equal treatment in applications for farm loans and business loans, police brutality, since they'd started the council uh, back in, in, in 1951. And they'd had a conference with 15,000 Black folks in the all-Black town of Mount Bayou, Mississippi, also in the 1950s. So, okay. Bob goes with Amzie's introduction to start organizing in Southwest Mississippi. And he goes with a few other Southern black students, most of them from Mississippi. So they know the territory. They know all of the references, right? They know the rhythms. Um, and the fruits of that organizing can be seen in today's black political power in Mississippi, including the kind of, in I mean, it's amazing to me. I, sometimes I'll listen to the current head of the NAACP, the national head, Derek Johnson, and also the local Mississippi head of the NAA, and both of them talk about how they learned how to organize from the SNCC folks who stayed in Mississippi and continued to organize. Because that's one of the things Ms. Baker told us. She said, you may not see what you're working for right away, but if you do nothing, nothing changes, right? You may not see it, but if you don't do it, right? So what you saw was these people taking up 
It's not like I pass the baton because my thing is, look, honey, I'm going to be on this baton. You can be on the other side. When I fall back, somebody else takes my place, but I'm going to be like Miss Baker. We're all going to be moving with this baton. Okay, so, um, so what we're doing is we're tapping into networks and also particularly um, building relationships for, so the folks know they can trust you. And I'll end because I otherwise I would start talking about going into Lowndes County, Alabama with Stokely Carmichael and how there's somebody there who brings us in because he's already organizing Lowndes County. But I'm going to stop there. OK. All right. All right. All right. Well, let's 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 talk about, you know, we, we started talking about the extremism, got a little bit into the organizing. So let's talk about what that kind of I think that this kind of flows into with the freedom schools, because some of the folks on this call may not have ever, and let me change slides, I think, right? Yeah, good, good. Um, oh, not the, that one. Uh, um, freedom schools are still around. Okay. And I'm know. sorry, uh, that's actually Drum and Spear. So oh. I, I don't know whether you have the uh, Negro history book, um, mm. not that one, but if you don't have Negro history, let's not do these yet, because those are the Drum and Spear. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, that's fine. Cool. Um, that's cool. Okay. But the freedom schools are still around, but some folks on this call may not have heard about them. So um, tell us kind of about the freedom schools and even about the residential school and how this all came into, how this all fits into this history and piece of puzzle too. So in terms of freedom schools, um, you know, when I started the residential freedom school, I was actually ripping off the idea of freedom schools that SNCC organizer in Mississippi had conceived of and developed. Mm -hmm. um, now, let, let me just mention them, uh, since you mentioned it, what the freedom schools were. It was a way to bring young, young Black people, first of all, you know, were taught that the Civil War was the, well, Black and white children in the South were taught that the Civil War was the, the war of Northern aggression. And it still may be taught that way for all I know um, in some places. But, um, but they weren't taught to think. They were taught to, to recite, um, to not question, to not challenge. Um, and so... What Charlie decided is because he came from a whole a group of a family of educators, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but his thing was, let's do freedom schools. And in those freedom schools, young people who um, uh, are not in school during the summer, and, and this was mainly during the 1964 Freedom Summer, when we brought the 700 young people down, uh, primarily white students, to um, help register voters uh, because so many black folks had been killed while trying to register to vote. So um, we, uh, so the schools were to talk about what other things, you know, so we had black history. We had, we even had um, some schools teaching haiku so that um, you could use haiku as a way of getting your feelings out in very few words. Um, they uh, looked at the, the um, Mississippi state constitution, for example, and um uh, were asked that, so these black students are being asked, well, read this 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 um, little you know part of the Constitution. Does this um, work for you? You know, is this helping you and your family? Do you think it's even helping poor white people in Mississippi? Okay, if you had to um, do a Constitution that worked for you and your family, what would you write in it? So it's always to think about not what is, but what should be. And that's one of the things that the residential freedom schools did. Uh, but it also, you know, you're you're reading Langston Hughes. You're you're don't, you're doing um, a lot of um, a lot of things that would have been denied black students at that time. So okay. that and that's and it, it usually it brought also what was interesting is that the things that we were um, uh, teaching in the freedom schools also the kids then went back to their parents some of whom could not read and write because if you were poor, if you were black or you were white, if you were poor, you probably were not well-educated. And so um, so a lot of the, a, a number of the black kids are now going in and sharing this knowledge with their parents. And it was wonderful. And it was a way of also organizing because the parents are getting interested in it. And, oh, what is this about? And then you get them to register to vote. And, you know, it's one thing leads to another. It's wonderful. We had we had community centers in Mississippi then, too. And again, one of the few times that black folks in some of these areas had doctors talking to them and explaining what's going on and giving them inoculations and you know so but again it's it's it was needed but it was also an organizing tool to get folks to understand you have the power to do these things and one of the ways you get that power is through the vote okay so 
I decide that um, I want to riff off this and do a residential freedom school. And um, I wanted to get the young organizers of our Southern projects in Mississippi, Alabama, Southwest Georgia, Arkansas, to get together with the young folks from our Northern projects like Chicago. So I was hoping that the hopefulness and the organizing experiences of the young Southern organizers would energize the Northern teenagers. And at the same time, I wanted the young Southern teens to see that the North wasn't heaven, right? It wasn't, it was basically just up South. Okay, so we sent the word out to our projects um, throughout you know, the South and then to our friends of SNCC offices in the North, because one of the things SNCC had was a network, a network is really key through all of this, right? Network that we had developed um, in, in Chicago, in Philadelphia, and you know that helped protect us in some ways, they would call into the sheriff. We had campus friends of SNCC. We had a coordinator in the national office who would co coordinate the friends of SNCC group. So one of them though was in Chicago. And so in 1965, we brought young folks together based in a black church in Chicago. And we had writing classes, um, a Chicago teacher, black teacher taught black history. Uh, we used Lerone Bennett's Before the Mayflower. We read books by Langston Hughes, poetry by Gwendolyn Brooks, because you know she's a Chicago native. We mm -hmm. watched and analyzed a, a few curated films, um, mm -hmm. many mainly those that we knew and talked about organizing. I should mention, by the way, one of the best films about organizing in the Southern movement is Freedom Song. Danny Glover, R Loretta Devine, all the black stars you ever know about. Oh, and my favorite, David Strathern plays, plays um, the Justice Department, uh, uh, John Doerr. It is the, I, I, I use it with all my teacher, the PD workshops. Freedom Song, mm -hmm. um, wonderful. Okay, so, but we didn't have that then. So there were a couple of others. But the main thing is that, oh, and we also, I had asked um, a couple, a few SNCC organizers to come up. So um, Stokely came up from wherever he was. I think he was in Lowndes County then, Alabama. Ivanhoe, Charlie Cobb, they all came up and did sessions. Okay. But the kind of dialogue we had was really quite amazing. And when the young Southern kids talked about how they'd convinced their mother or their uncle or whoever, you know, to register to vote, or how they'd sat in and made the white restaurant that had always denied them a seat, forced them through their organizing to serve them and their parents and their community, right? Mm -hmm. It was just eye-opening for these Northern kids. And it helped the young Chicago kids who had been coming, the, the, the Chicago kids were all coming out of that horrible high-rise monstrosity um, uh, Cabrini Green. Mm -hmm. It helped them realize what might be possible, right? and that maybe things could change, and that just maybe these young folks themselves could be part of that change, right? So the Chicago kids helped the Southern kids realize it wasn't just about getting black faces in high places. Because, you know, in Chicago, they had black politicians, but most, most of them only cared about getting black people into office the next election. So they weren't really about real change. And it helped the Southern young people understand that you had to make sure the politicians you elected stayed accountable to the communities and work for their best interests, which meant that you had to stay organized because that's the only mm. way they were going to hear the pressure. So lessons that we could still use today. <laughs> <laughs> so then you, you know, you did all of these wonderful things. You, you know, you're around this, have this network and you have all that going. So you helped to found a bookstore, Drum and Spear. So how did that come about? Yeah. Well, in, in 1968, Charlie Cobb, the one I mentioned before, a primo organizer in Mississippi, who had conceived the Freedom Schools, he decided to come back home to Washington, D.C. And he wanted to start a Black bookstore that would also be a center for political conversations and discussions, right? Now, as I said, he came from educators. I mean, his great-great-grandfather somewhere, one of those grandfathers, had started a school in Mississippi for the formerly enslaved um, during Reconstruction. And his mother was head of the foreign language department, uh, yeah, foreign language department at Howard University. His aunt Charlotte was superintendent of English for the DC public schools. 
So we kind of, you know, had this network we could tap into with the bookstore. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I came down from um, New York City. I had been going to Columbia. I'd stopped going. Um, and I go down um, with, a f and, and I join a few other DC SNCC folks to start the store. Mm -hmm. And actually the first time I saw the store, it was engulfed in um, tear gas because it was 1968 and there had been the uprisings. And so this had been yet another tear gassing of 14th street. So I go through this thing, I get to the store um, and they, the SNCC folks, Charlie Cobb, Cortland Cox, Curtis Hayes, they decide, decided to locate the store in the heart of a major lower income black community right on 14th street. And we saw the store very much as just a part of, well, really a continuation of the organizing that we had done all those years in SNCC. It was part of the community community education we'd always focused on. So by 1970, the store had become the largest black bookstore in the country. And we were selling to folks um, in the neighborhood as well as those outside. That's the outside of the store. Mm -hmm. And um, we were selling to folks, uh, to colleges like Cornell and UMass Amherst and UC Berkeley. And that was the store. Um, and. Uh, one of the slides you would see, there was a big children's section too. Um, and we carried all manner of books by and about folks uh, from the African diaspora, the US, Africa, the Caribbean, uh, the UK, wherever, right? And so all those are the books we carried. Um, and also books by other people of color, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asian Americans, um, and we had books, you know, with Tony, Mar we, oh, we had book events, we had book events. Toni Morrison, Gwendolyn Brooks, Lucille Clifton, Amiri Baraka, just many, many wonderful authors. And um, folks for the neighborhood, you know, they were welcomed. And, and for many, it was the first time they'd ever seen an actual black author. And yeah. I remember when we got, um, and to the right of that slide, you'll see Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, one of my favorite books, okay. And I remember when we first got Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. That book, Zora Neale Hurston's book, right? It was the first time I had read a real love story set within an, an almost entirely Black world. And it was such a wonderful book. I mean, mm -hmm. I and the other women, I mean, it was a romance. It was a romance. It's so beautifully written. Oh, gosh. And, and, and the dialogue, the way people really talked, right? So mm -hmm. I and the other women in the store would almost accost every black woman who came into the store and say, you got to read this book. <laughs> it's a romance. It has black people in it. Oh my God. Right. So, so then um, we started a publishing house, uh, Drum and Spear Press, mm -hmm. and we published a coloring book. Oh, now I don't know if you have the, oh, oh no, I have it. I have it because I wanted to show you. Um, okay. So um, this is Children of Africa and it was, mm -hmm. and this is the back of it. And we we started the press, and that was our first book, um, children's book. Um, and it was by Eloise Greenfield, who is now this, oh, just foremost Black children's author. She's She was a friend of mine, and she passed away. But um, we published that, and uh, we also published, I don't know if you have that. So um, just so you don't have to worry about this slide, Bubbles was the first book, that, and we published her first book, Eloise Greenfield's first book. And there's just this wonderful, oh, it's about a child who learns his first three words and it's just so cute. And there's one where he's thinking about how he's gonna uh, talk to his his um, older brother. Yes, his no, his older, his little sister about yeah. learning his first three words and how excited he, what she is and stuff. So um, it's just a wonderful little book. And, um, you know, because we knew his Aunt Charlotte Brooks, superintendent of English, the first book party was in her her house. Um, I had this great idea, you know, I said, oh, we'll get a bubble machine. And, but she, you know, was in one of those brownstones with wooden floors. So I had a bubble machine and the bubbles, when they, they're soap buzzables. So they come down and they made everything so slippery. People had to hold on to the, anyway, that's another story. I digress. Okay. But it was a wonderful, um, a wonderful book party and we had just wonderful fun. Okay. So <laughs> then the black employees at HEW, which was the health, education, and welfare um, department. Um, you know, DC is government stuff, right? So health, education, and welfare is now health and human services, which is HHS. So okay. 
HEW offered the black employees space in the HEW building, this big old government building in downtown DC. And their supervisors thought that they'd want a clothing store. But these black employees said they wanted an offshoot of Drum and Spear Bookstore. So mm -hmm. I founded a subsidiary of the bookstore um, a couple of years after Drum and Spear. Uh, I called it Ma Lazo because I asked Jennifer Lawson. Oh, I should have said, by the way, the person who did the illustrations for this um, was um, later becomes head of all programming for PBS. Um, but what and also whole other thing at Corporation for Public Broadcasting. But the main thing is she um, did the posters for the Lowndes County Freedom Organization in Lowndes County, Alabama. And that photo, the, the poster of the Black Panther, because, and I won't mm -hmm. tell you the story of how we got to the Black Panther, but um, the Black Panther, she does that, right? Then she gets to DC, she does this and does all these illustrations and, and um, it's a coloring book. So um, I asked her, give me a Swahili word for like books, education, something like that. And so she gives me Malezo. M-A-E-L-E-Z-O, which was a great title if you're being political, but it was when, you know, you didn't have websites and, you know, Google. So if they're trying to remember how to get our phone number, nobody remembers the Malezo. It was hard, but they knew how to do this. Okay. Um, so I founded this store. It's a cute little store, has these books. Okay. But while I'm there at the cash register in this bookstore, in this major government building, I get a visit from the rep from Scholastic Books, you know, which we all know is probably the largest publisher of children's books in the country. And he comes in, he shows me his catalog and asks if I want to order any titles. And I'm leafing through the catalog. And I said, well, where's Sunflowers for Tina? You know, now this was a, Sunflowers for Tina was a wonderful book, picture book that I had selected for the children's section of Drum and Spear. And I also carried it with Mao Lezo. Now it wasn't black authored, and it, but it was just lovely. Had the sweetest illustrations about a young black kid, child, little girl who decided to plant a sunflower seed in her small, rather barren backyard in the city, right? And her grandmother tells her nothing will grow. I mean, grandmother very nurturing, but tells her, "Oh, you know, Tina, nothing's going to grow here. You know, don't get your hopes up." But, you know, yeah, this gorgeous sunflower starts to bloom, right? So it's, it has all kinds of allegorical meaning, of course. But the book, just it's just mainly a lovely story with lovely, lovely illustrations. So, okay, this white salesman looks surprised that I have mentioned sunflowers for Tina. Right? And he says to me, I swear to God, he says, oh, I didn't know this was a black bookstore. Okay. Then he goes back to his car gets what I guess was, you know, what the people of color catalog, I don't know. And he yeah. just assumed that this was a white bookstore since it was in a government building. So why would I want to look at or, or much less sell, you know, any books besides those with white children in them, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I ordered the books from him. He left and I never saw him again. <laughs> Not a surprise there. Well, um, I, I want to uh, get to this uh, question about your recent speech, and then we'll get we'll take some questions from um, the audience. So yes, and I'm um, sorry, I've got to say yes, I did get the books. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, you recently did a speech about book bans, and you spent time in your you have spent a lot of time in your career in children's book editing and publishing, and you know obviously sales as well. So when you see groups like Moms for Liberty and, you know, their so-called leaders or other so-called leaders calling for the banning of literature, what do you want us to know? What more can we do? What do you want? What would you, what wisdom will you impart to us today to help us in this fight um, against these knuckleheads who want to take our books away? <laughs> and you said it very politely. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> Let, let me first say, and then I'll, I'll get to what I think you're already doing, but would just emphasize the, you know, for me, the folks who want to ban books are really trying to ensure that their own children, white children, don't find out about this history, right? It's not really about black children. They don't want their children to know about the legacies of slavery, not enslavement, but all of the things that we, that exist now about economic injustice, about climate change, about all that stuff that is a legacy of slavery aside from all the other not good stuff. Okay. 
they don't want them to learn about the fact that white supremacy really is systemic and not just about, you know, some bad apples in the barrel who just haven't had enough sensitivity training. Okay. So the book banners particularly don't want their kids to learn about these historical events and concepts because they know that young people are often very much about fairness, particularly at a young age. And that means they might want to change things and make them fairer. And the banners, these book banners, definitely don't want kids to learn about the times when various folks got together to change things, often successfully, because that's when you struggle and you win. They don't want them to know we won. They don't want young people to see other young people just like them who organized to make change or to see that it wasn't just, just Dr. King or Rosa Parks, as amazing as they were. And by the way, we really need to talk about Dr. King outside of March on Washington. And I have a dream and talk about him the way we envision, we, we show him in speeches, in Eyes on the Prize, where he's talking about, we need a radical redistribution of economic, pe economic power, radical redistribution of economic power. But we've neutered him and so we've got to bring him up. Anyway, but what we want what, what young people need to see is not only the the radical dr king or the radical rosa parks because you know gene theo harris has done a wonderful book on on you know the the real rosa parks <laughs> excuse me but what young people need to see is folks just like them and their mothers and their uncles and their teachers and their clergy folks who just like them regular people who made and sustained the various movements for change because then the young people will continue to work for real democratic change. And that's what these book banners, banners really don't want to see. Mm -hmm. Oh, and in terms of how you, to, to keep going with what you all are already doing, a lot of it has to do with, um, what again, what you're doing, which is looking at those board um, boards of education and those small elections. I mean, one of the things that we knew when we were organizing the South was that, it was the justice of the peach peace. It was the judges. It was the uh, tax collectors. It was. It wasn't just the mayors or the House of Representatives or the. It's those small things. And and as a matter of fact, when um, oh, what was the thing that came in uh, just be, with uh, Obama in 2010 that preceded the crazy people, um, the Freedom Caucus, the Tea Party, the Tea Party. I remember reading a New York Times article and they and the Tea Party actually said we have taken a, a page from the civil rights movement in terms of organizing locally. And then somehow we forgot, we the movement forgot to do that. So um, that local organizing and particularly with the school bands, shoring up the teachers, when they try and threaten a teacher, normal people, thinking people need to be there to support them. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that, that's a major part of it. Mm -hmm. I agree. I completely agree. And librarians. <laughs> Julie, did you do you have some of the questions? Yes. So um, Janice, who's our North Carolina program director, said that this is the second time that she's heard the framing up south. Um, what is the definition of this term? Like she, she has an idea, but she wants to hear your definition. I got you. Um, it just means that the kind of racism, the people, see there, let me just, I'm going to back up and do a little historical thing. Um, when I was doing um, Slave Catcher, Slave Resisters, it was a 90 minute doc for the, um, for the History Channel. And what was interesting is that they did use the same kind of things, um, uh, points that they used during the civil rights movement. It was, there was no racism in the North um, that, uh, it was basically three people who did abolition in from the north. It was, you know, um, Garrison and Frederick Douglass and Harry Tubman. And then in the south, you had Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and uh, oh, and, and, and Kennedy, you know. So you had a certain similarity. But part of that was the north was always supportive of the good stuff. Right. They weren't racist. It was only the south that was racist. It was the only only the south that had enslaved people. Well, no, you know. What we see in the, I'm, I'm now doing a, a, you know, as you heard, a, a documentary for the National Park Service on Frederick Douglass, but I've also done past ones. And one of the things, points that I've used now in three films is um, a, a, a sentence that I used that Leon Litwack, who is a, a 
a Columbia University professor who specializes in, you know, um, antebellum and, and, and enslavement work. And he had this piece in there, 1994, right? Op-ed in the New York Times where he said, the worth of the um, enslaved on the eve of the Civil War is equal to the combined worth of railroads, banks, and factories. Enslaved people, railroads, banks, and factories, right? Equal, combined worth. Okay, so I'm using it, I mean, Hassan Jeffries uses it in the film, the Douglas film, but the main thing is it's up South because the racism that you see in the South that they try and say was only in the South, the support for enslavement that they try and say was only in the South. The Boston factories, I lived in Boston from Cambridge for 23 years working at Blackside, which was the producer of a number of films I worked on. Um, you know, you saw those factories. They are fueled by what's going on in the South. When you saw the insurance companies, those are fueled by the enslavement. So when they say the industries, the banks, railroads, and factories, it's not just the Southern stuff. So when you say up South, that's what I hear when I go south because they say, honey, Chicago's just up south, right? All of the racism that you see, it's a little more covered, but um, not so much. And now, honey, with Trump, it's really not covered. I mean, it's so, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that, did that explain it? Because I could go on. <laughs> it explained it to me. You just educated me, so. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, um, you know, can I just say one, one quick, I don't want to, oh, ooh. Do I have to, do I have time for a short story? You related you tell, to that. You do whatever you do whatever you want, Judy. You tell whatever story you want to tell. People are okay because I don't want to go over. You. Okay, um, my my cousin Muriel. This is it's 1953. I want to say, and 1953, very proper. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, she was she was about to get married, and so she's um she was my cousin in law. So she was marrying my cousin Brucey, who was a graphic artist. Okay. She's a teacher and she's gonna go along River, Riverside Drive. And for those who don't know it, um, Riverside Drive is right looking out on the Hudson, very pleasant, right? But at the time she's looking, it's very white. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's all white until you start getting up into Harlem. Okay, so it's the Upper West Side. It's, you know, so she's looking, she has her little white gloves on. She has her, you know, kind of Jackie, Ken well, Jackie Kennedy hadn't happened yet, but you know, she's looking very proper, very besuited, you know, and she's going up to these apartment buildings on Riverside Drive. And so um, now she's born and raised in New York, but in Harlem. And it's 1953. And so she goes along to these Upper West Side, you know, Riverside Drive apartment buildings and consistently gets told very nicely, though. I mean, it's not like the rabid racists of the South. She is told, Oh, I'm sorry, sweetheart. We don't rent to color. Now, some said Negro, but basically, you know, she got the point. Um, and so um, because there was no Fair Housing Act yet, right? Mm -hmm. So they could very openly say in 1953, I'm sorry, we're not going to rent to you, but they're going to do it very nicely, you know. Um, so that's the story. That's what, and I think about growing up in Tarrytown, we knew that no Black person could get on the other side of Broadway. Now I lived under the hill, so I could run. I was always late for everything. So I could run for the train and get there in time once I heard the whistle, okay? My father worked in the, you know, helped organize the United Auto Workers local at the plant, you know, where you could tell time by the ships coming off the plant, all right? And my friends were, were Irish, Italians, Polish, um, I wish you the mainly that, yeah, and black and black people. Okay, so that's what I grew up in. But we also knew that no black person lived on the other side of Broadway. And in fact, when I find when I get south and I get into SNCC, we had a, a Terry Tanners for Civil Rights organization that you know they helped they they formed to help support me and stuff. You know, and a lot of them, you know, were. Um, uh, the commuters, you know, the, the the white folks who were going into the city, taking the train down. But um, one of them was this wonderful black um, uh, doctor who, as a matter of fact, worked for Planned Parenthood. Black doc. She was the first black doctor I had ever seen. I wanted to call her name, but I've forgotten it now. And her husband was a black architect and they had met at Howard, at Howard University. Okay. She was the first black person who got to move onto Broadway. 
So when we had the one of the, the first meetings of um, Tarrytown is for civil rights, I went up to her and I said, oh my goodness, you know, we are so amazed. You you moved on Broadway. And she said, oh, every, every black person tells me that because <laughs> we couldn't believe it had happened. Oh my goodness. So yeah, that's the end of the story. <laughs> that was that was good. I'm, you tell whatever story you want to tell. That, okay. that was a great story. Okay. Um, okay. What would you say specific? This is from Esther. What spe- what would you say specifically to teachers who want to teach the truth and the total history of this country, but they're afraid of losing their jobs? And I will tell you, this is not for me to say. I really is. I mean, because I'm not. I, I don't have two kids to support. You know, and, and I'm about to lose my job. Right. So I I have the luxury of saying what I'm about to say, but it really is because I hear this a lot for Teaching for Change, um, whom I'm very close with and I love everything they do. And and we were once on a call because some SNCC people were doing a one of their monthly um, teacher workshops, Teaching for Change, Zen Education Project. Um, and um, while we were on doing this, this PD uh, class, online class, you know, Deborah Nemenkart, the, the head of Teaching for Change, got something from one of the teachers on the in the session who said that he had just gotten a um, an email from his supervisor, whatever, you know, uh, it wasn't the principal, um, saying that he needed to come in to talk to the supervisor the next day. He was in Jersey, by the way, in New Jersey, um, because of some a complaint that had come in about something he was teaching. Okay. So it, it's very real to me. And I, and then I got on and, you know, sent something to support him as, you know, eyes on the prize and, t- and, and, you know, visiting professor at Brown university and stuff. And then I got a, an email from a librarian who had moved because she had from Jersey from around his same community. Um, now he is black. She is white. And I, I set up this correspondence with her, but the main thing is, um, you know, part of me says, look, I'm used to talking, I was used to talking to black people who thought they could be killed if they tried to register to vote. But they also knew that they had to do this, that somewhere they ha- it had to end, they had to do something. And so they put a lot on the line to do this, but they did not do it alone. It's not like one person went up to the, the white registrar and did it by themselves. So the other part is whether there's anybody else in your school, if there are any parents, even if it's just one or two, so that you're not out there by yourself, it's too hard, you know, and you're jeopardizing too much. But, um, you know, I, another story there, there was a, um, there was a woman, oh gosh. Okay. Mims, Florida. Oh gosh. I'm about to forget their names, but Mr. and Mrs. Mm, come on, Judy. Okay, teacher. And he was head of the NAACP. Um, he he was head of the NAACP. She was a teacher, both black um, in Mims, Florida. And it may come to me what their names are. And so she, the teacher, um, used to take, have a book, box of books. This is 1951 a box of books under her desk, because again, segregated schools, right? And so um, she would teach from this hidden box, but before she would bring the box out, Mims, Florida, um, she would ask one of her black students to go to the window to keep a lookout so that if they saw the white superintendent of schools coming by, she could then gather them all up, put them under under her desk. Okay, so this was the kind of teacher that, she was. And then 1951, um, uh, this person who was relating being in her classroom, a student who was a classroom then, um, says that they were walking past this house, which had been bombed the night before, Christmas Eve, 1951. The husband was was killed immediately. The wife, the teacher, died 10 days later. She was a teacher. She was teaching what would now be called banned books. Um, And they paid a price for that. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to say a lot of, there's a history for this, you know, books and truthful education has always, always, always been dangerous to the people who want 
the system to say the same. And so um, it's easier for me to give advice if I'm in the same situation because I feel very not good about giving advice because you're the ones who have the lives and livelihoods on the line. But I will say there is a history of this and that using organizing within your school with one or two, and I know you got to be careful about who you talk to, whom, whom you talk to, um, but um, if you can find just one or two people, it really helps. Okay, this was kind of a very long Four. question. Oh, I got it, I got it. Harry and Harriet Moore in Mims, Florida. Okay. <laughs> Um, so last now, that, that would have awakened, awakened me at one o'clock this morning. Okay. Well, we don't want that to happen. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is my last question in the chat. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a big question. So I'm trying to figure out how to best frame this, but basically it's, I, I think the way I look at it is like, you might have people who you know, hear talking points about racism or things of that nature, but don't really understand systemic racism. They don't even know what that is. They don't, how, if you meet someone like that, or if people on this call have friends like that. I guess, what's your best advice for trying to explain that to people or resources you would recommend? Um, just because I know there's a lot of people who are very ignorant of history. <laughs> yes, there is a PBS CM film. So I, I think about what I use with with uh, PD wor uh, workshops. Um, there is a film, to, oh gosh, what is it called? Come on, Judy. Oh, ooh, 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 ooh. Um, because it explains um, uh, redlining. To me, that is the clearest that you will see where it's systemic, where the federal government themselves said black people will not be given loans. Black people cannot live here. When you have um, that first development for returning World War II vets, where they got advantage of the GI Bill, only white people were allowed to live in this development. And because it was, it was really affordable housing, they could get GI loans, but it was segregated on Long Island. And now I'm also blocking on the name. It may come to me at one o'clock in the morning too. But in any event, there the is- trace, Traces of, um, someone posted, traces of the trade? No, that's about enslavement. Okay. Um, I know that one too. Um, oh gosh, it is done by Third World Newsreel. Uh, no, uh, uh, yes. Um, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Oh golly, see, this is gonna drive me crazy. Um, it is done by California Newsreel. California Newsreel, uh, which does a one some wonderful, um, oh gosh, wonderful documentaries that can be useful here. But it's about left. If I send it to you, could you send it out to the people on this call? Mm -hmm. I can send you a direct link. I just didn't think to me. But redlining is the clearest because it's the way, see, because the generational wealth is in the property. So yes. A. If you are not allowed to get homes, if they are devalued, and by the way, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is like, they call it the DMV, the District Maryland, Virginia area. Um, what they found, and this was through the CBS affiliate here, is that um, the that black homes in a really wealthy black area in Maryland were undervalued. And they did a sting operation basically, which is how they found this out. Mm -hmm. That if houses are your generational wealth, and if you from generation to generation to generation are then um, systemically um, undervalued and therefore have less way, wealth, you you are throughout the generations, then you are burdened. If you find, find, for example, that you are a Tuskegee Airman and you come back. And you think, well, maybe I can get, you know, a, a job with American Airlines or TWA, which was there. But they say we don't hire black pilots or um, at a certain point, I know now I am older, honey, I am older. Um, and I go into a, a store. I know that I, with my little gray hair and stuff, I can be followed. And I, I, you know, and I judge it. It's like when black people go into a restaurant and say, think to myself, and, and you kind of look around if you are being treated badly by a wait staff. And then you look around, you say, okay, let me just first check it. Is this wait staff just having a bad day and they're treating everybody like this? Or is it just cause I'm the only black 
person or a couple in this restaurant. You know, mm -hmm. there there are ways that um, black folks automatically think. Um, the police department is a whole other thing. You know, I mean, what happened to George Floyd? When I was at the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice, and um, and I was uh, the unite the um, director of communications, right? When this whole spate of police brutality happened during the mid '80s, what I did is what I learned in SNCC, which is to do a chronology so that people would know that what was happening with Michael Stewart, that he was beaten to death by five transit policemen in the um, uh, subway uh, for doing uh, uh, graffiti, graffiti, 25 years old. All he was doing was graffiti. And he tried to run away and they caught him and they beat him and he died 25 days later. Okay, so, um, but I wanted to show, it's not just because this police officer, California News Bureau, race, that's it. Race, the power of an illusion. That's the one, hello, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with Michael Stewart, um, but I, I wanted them to know it's not just cause they, you know, hadn't had enough sensitivity training, right? It's not that officer Sullivan shoots 69 year old Eleanor bumpers in an eviction. Um, he says she's with a shotgun, by the way, because she's, um, eight months late in her rent. And I'm doing the weekly commentary, which I, you know, have to get the subject matter, and then I have to write the commentary for the executive uh, executive secretary of the of the organization. And so I see this in the paper, you know, it's it's in one of the New York papers. And so I call the reporter who is reporting this, and I said, "Can I talk to the neighbor whom you interviewed?" And he said, "Well, he's a Latino, or actually a Puerto Rican," and he said, "Um." Uh, and I don't know, he, you know, he doesn't want the police to come to him. Uh, and he said, but I'll give it to you if you let, you know, but be very careful and not use his name. So I call this guy who was Mrs. Bumper's neighbor. And the neighbor says, he's hesitant at first. I talked to him. You know, it's one of the things the, the, um, that you all learned and that I learned organizing in, in, the, in, in SNCC. You know, how do you talk to people so that they know you know, you're honest and decent and, you know, um, and need your help. So I, I called this neighbor and I said, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to write an article. I will not use your name. I will not mention, you know, any contact info for you, but it turned, I had called him because the reporter had said that this neighbor had used Mrs. Bumper, um, uh, as a babysitter. And that they used to drop off their two-year-old at her house when they went to work, because both of them worked. But they had to stop doing that because she was so infirm from, um, um, what is it when you can't work too swell? Um, do, 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 do. See, I'm past 8.30 and my words are going on me. Um, what is it? I got, oh, arthritis. She had arthritis. Mm -hmm. And so um, he said, we had to stop leaving our two-year-old because she has arthritis. And so she couldn't move well enough, right? This is the person who Officer Sullivan said, I had to shoot her to death with a shotgun because she was coming to at me too quickly, right? So, but while I'm doing all of this, what I want to do is a chronology, right? Because I want to show, like we show, I, I won't show it now, but we did, we had Jack Minnis, crusty old white guy who ran our research department, honey, got, got research from a stone before there was Google, websites, any of this stuff, right? Because he wanted to show the systemic nature of the racism, right? So mm -hmm. um, who owned Toddle House? Well, you know, so in fact, when we, that Toddle House, that, that um, sit in, mm -hmm. yes, we bought um, shares in Toddle House so that two of our SNCC staff people um, could go up to the shareholder meeting and for what little good it did, but, you know, say, and why do you have a segregated, you know? I mean, we understood the, um, the connection between our corner restaurant and the corporate power that owned it, right? So, um, for the, so Jack Minnis had done this chronology of all of the violence and intimidation with photos from our photo department and the reports that we used to issue each day, um, and he does this chronology. It's like seven pages. It's on um, a wonderful website for documents called CrimVet. C R M Vet dot org right and the original mm -hmm. he does these documents okay so um so i did that for that because i wanted folks to know this is systemic 
you cannot just think that it, you're going to, you know, fire Officer Sullivan and suddenly everything's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this has been going on for some time, which is what I wanted to show with this chronology. You know, going all the way back, these are all of the incidents of black police, of, of white police killing, beating to death. And this is before we even had, you know, um, oh, the uh, Haitian, um, whose name I can't remember. Anyway, the more recent ones. These, mm -hmm. This was just up through the, the mid 1980s. So mm -hmm. that for me, that's systemic. It is, it's not just one individual. It's not just discrimination. It's right. racism. It is in the system. Yeah, Freddie Gray in Baltimore, you got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, another good resource on redlining is The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. That's a really good book um, that yes. I have that I'm still working my way through, but that's another uh, great great place to start when you want to talk about redlining. Judy, this has been so informative, so wonderful, and we could go on forever because you are just, you are walking history, and it's amazing, and I love it. Um, the other, the other uh, thing that I thought about, though, when we were talking, and I think I, I think I mentioned this to you before. You know, Heather Cox Richardson, um, the historian, does a lot I, with I us. I was on that that one, yes. Oh, okay, so you were on that one. So I was right on that one, and I also, um, uh, because I look at PBS NewsHour, and so okay. she had done a piece around with her new book. Yeah. Well, she she had said right before we went on that Zoom that she hoped that we were writing what we do down at Red Wine and Blue because. We are creating history, and I had not really ever thought of it that way, but, you know, sitting and listening, I, and I'm sure that in the beginning, you probably didn't think that way either as a, you know, young, you know, teenager and 20-something, you know, that you were creating history and around all these folks who were going to, you know, be the names that we have now in, in the books on our shelves <laughs> or yes, the authors of those books. But what you say is so important. And one of the things, two things, one is um, one of my uh, close colleagues, uh, Dr. Emily Crosby, who does local movement scholarship, works with us at our various Duke University uh, projects. And she said, you know, SNCC is probably the most documented of all the civil rights, 60s civil rights movement organizations because um, Ruby Doris Smith Robinson, who was the strong administrator of our SNCC office, national office, she demanded reports, right? Mm -hmm. We wrote reports. We, I mean, we there is documentation about what we did. But the second part, which is archiving what you are doing at Red Wine. See, every time I say Red Wine, I want to say Red Wine and Vinegar. I swear to God, because for me, <laughs> but anyway, but Red Wine and Blue, um, it's we, we got uh, we're under we're doing a Mellon grant where we're working with six HBCUs, black colleges and six uh, civil rights organizations. Mm -hmm. And so we're about to start those. I have a meeting next uh, tomorrow uh, to to with the heads of all of those civil rights museums and uh, the HBCU uh, professors whom we're working with. But the other project is a Mellon grant project. And um, we've had it for three years. We did our SNCC digital workshop. Uh, a website with them, but we also now are doing a um, uh, a program that um, allows for conversations with SNCC veterans and uh, the Movement for Black Lives young people. Mm -hmm. There are six organizations, Def Dream Defenders out of uh, um, Florida, BYP 100, a number of them, six. And we're, the conversations are is one part are, is whatever, of that of that grant, but the other part is archiving. Because part of what Cortland Cox, who is the, the chair of SNCC Legacy Project, always drums into us is we are the ones who should define our history, right? Mm -hmm. It should not be other people. And the way that you can try and, and um, define that years into the future is if you, have, if you have archived your documents, if you cite them. So for example, all my stuff is at Duke University because I know they have the money to keep them. They really wanted them. They, you know, we work with them. But, you know, if you know of some other institution, but for for you, you are doing such, such important work. You want to be able to make sure that the way you are defined, who you were, what you did, and why you did it, why you did it is archived and set. So yeah, I wow. hope you do. <laughs> 
Thank you. And again, thank you so much, you know, and, you know, maybe, you know, if you have time sometime in the future, we can do this again on, you know, some other subjects that, you know, you were in and things that you were a part of, but I just really so very much appreciate you coming tonight. Everybody in the chat is thanking you so very much. People were just, I think every, all of us were just wrapped, you know, just listening to all these, you know, great stories that you have and, and, the, and seeing the things that you've done. So oh, again, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much.